and ooh, it's got four rings of security. And that was very innovative, wasn't it? Well, uh, <coughs> Baltics had it in the 1969, 1979, right? Yeah. It wasn't quite, it, you know, everything that's old is new again, right? Yeah, and it's interesting though that this was also the first undertaking where an operating system was not written in assembly. Um, it was written in a high-level language, PO1, was attempt, which was intended to be a combination of what we would recognize today as C, uh, Fortran and Cobalt, with the best features of Fortran and Cobalt. So, uh, not to mention the worst. Yeah, PO1 yeah, well, wasn't so bad. And I, I see some heads nodding out here in the audience. Uh, to, Remember PO1. Uh, just as a side comment, this is not a dead system in, in very any real form. The last commercially known Baltic system shut down in 2000. So you're looking at an operating system that survived as probably the most secure system ever created until 2000, and it was surpassed by some very customized hardware that, surprisingly enough, looked a whole lot like. was a big year. This is where IBM really started investing in the concept of virtual machines. These two guys, you see pictures here. The one on the left is Bob Creasy, and the one on the right is Lester Camo. Uh, they, in, they introduced the concept to IBM, and since this was done at the Cambridge uh, Scientific Center, and then the naming of the system was, was involved in creating what's now called CMS. So you guys that are doing web content development, you nicked our algorithms, or at least our name anyway. The idea here was to, send, to do hardware simulation. And in fact, the machine that launched most of the Apollo programs, the 360-67, was designed essentially completely in software. The concept of a virtual machine, and IBM uses this technique today to test operating systems and hardware, is that they first implement a test architecture in software. And they use that simulation to generate the hardware that will run the operating system later. So in, 1960, in 1964, they used CP40, the version of VM that ran on the 360 Model 40, to simulate what the 36067 would actually be like. In fact, they had no hardware. They were able to simulate a full configuration without actually having any hardware at all. Let's take a side trip for a little bit of politics, and th this will resonate very much with, with those of you that, you know, that are here from the Unix community. Uh, Linux community people, raise your hand for me if you have Skunk Works in a Linux box to a company that's officially a Microsoft shop. Okay, and some people probably don't want to admit it because their boss is watching. This project, this whole VM uh, CP40 project, well, a lot of that was skunk works. It was done above board. Management knew it was going on. But Norm Rasmus and, and Creasy and Camo, they believed in the concept of virtual machines. They saw the potential of that idea. Management didn't necessarily buy into that. Although Norm was in, for, you know, he was in, in low to middle management, but he wasn't a senior executive. So what they did is they sold this to the senior management not as, we think this is going to be a viable operating system because senior management didn't want to hear about anything that was going to compete with their cash cow of CTSS what, or TSS. What, um, but what these guys said is, hey, but we're not going to really sell this thing. We're going to just use this in the lab because it will make our developers more productive. So we'll use it in the lab, but, but we're not really building a commercial operating system. In the back of their mind, they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you skunk works in a Linux box, you have something in common with these folks from the 1960s and 70s because they did the same thing and they played the same games we all do. Okay, so just to speed up a little bit, um, there's a lot of things we talked about with CP67, but eventually somebody in IBM management figured out that something was going on here. So some of the things that were part of a competing operating system were used to try to kill a project. This has happened three times in the history of IBM to this particular operating system. Every single time, the VM community has gone back to IBM and proved to them that it actually makes them more money than they actually realize. The process was with TSS. They tried to kill it. It became a migration aid for 
different away from early versions of the 360 to a later generation of hardware. The second time that the IBM tried to take that resulted in what the, or in the origins of the interactive office suite. So you can think about this, that ZVM is the direct origin of Microsoft Office. Now, you may throw rocks at us for that, but the concept of having interactive computing came from this. Third option was the idea of introduction lines. So and, and take a close look at that second point. Um, VM is reliable enough today that mean time between failure or MTBF on a, a VM mainframe today is measured in decades, not in years. That's pretty impressive. The system they were competing with back in the 1970s, that system had a mean time between failure that was less than the amount of time it took to reboot the operating system. Imagine, if you will, you're running some unspecified operating system whose name shall not be mentioned here, but which comes from Reverend Washington, and you get a blue screen of death, and it takes you longer to reboot from the blue screen of death than you ran before you got the blue screen of death, and that was normal. Looking out here to the audience, I see a couple of folks I recognize from Nationwide. Hey, Rick, how long have your, how long has your VM system been up? The production stuff has been up since January. That would be Nationwide.com running uh, IBM's version of, of Apache on top of Linux on top of ZVM. Thanks, sir. So we're, we're, we're actually going to have to knock it down uh, just because we want to do some maintenance, so there will be a planned outage. Yep. Okay. So from here, though, things start to split. In a lot of cases, if you look at 545 Tech Square in, in Boston, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of people going to lunch with each other. There's a lot of Chinese food being eaten. So, some of that stuff has filtered over into Bell Labs, and so if you want to take that one, uh, Scott. Okay. Right about then, um, remember on an earlier slide we talked about, there was a, a point that we didn't really go into. Uh, when the 360 originally came out, the developers, and I think my quote was, decried the lack of memory relocation hardware. What that basically meant is that the machine just didn't have, it would be like trying to run the Linux kernel on, a, on an IBM PC XT or a 286. You just didn't physically have the addressing hardware for memory to make virtual machines possible. That was one of Intel's innovations in the, in the 386 that the 286 didn't have. Well, the original IBM 360 all the people in the VM community really wanted that machine to have the address relocation hardware in it, and it didn't because IBM didn't think it was important because, well, CTSS didn't need it, and that was the only thing that mattered. Uh, at the same time, IBM was trying very hard to make the mainframe appeal to the scientific community because that was a potentially large customer, and they totally dropped the ball on the hardware design. And what ended up happening is MIT uh, and, and the other universities they basically said, well, the IBM mainframe doesn't have what we need. And so instead of awarding the contract to IBM, they went to Bell Labs and um, and, and, that, you know, they, I mean, they went to several other partners uh, that and said, well, you know, IBM doesn't have what we need. So they awarded the Mac contract to develop Multics to IBM's competitors. And this is basically why VM and, and Unix diverged at this point, had that boneheaded uh, sorry, IBM guys, had that boneheaded stunt not happen from IBM's hardware team. By the way, it wasn't that the technology didn't exist. There were like three different versions of the memory relocation hardware that had been built by the user community in the university market and, and some of their large customers had actually designed memory management hardware. IBM just didn't think it was important, declined to, to produce, provide it. And so they made their product unsuitable for the scientific environment and they lost this big contract, and that's why VM and Unix actually split. Had that not happened, Multics might very well have been implemented on an IBM mainframe, and the IBM mainframes might have been running Unix from the get-go, and we might all be looking at a totally different IT world. So this was a very seminal event in the history of computing. So it's a bit of evolutionary here. Uh, as Once, once uh, VM left the IBM labs, it became somewhat of the property of the customers. It's very interesting uh, in terms of the history of IBM, but this is one of the first times that IBM actually let the source code out with the operating system. And to this day, in the mainframe community, this is the only operating system that IBM supplies that comes with source. And so the users were able to modify it. They were able to
able to add to it. And so there was a lot of evolutionary activity to adding functionality to this operating system. And so that parallel evolution, the split that Scott talked about in terms of being, there's a group over here working on the deck hardware with uh, Multics and the IBMers, they're still, they're both working with open source operating systems the ability to modify just about anything. By the way, the, the uh, picture in the corner there, little side note, that is one of the slides, um, and you can see how primitive it, it is. It was uh, not a PowerPoint deck, it's an actual film slide. That is from the original product announcement of the very first version of IBM's VM, VM operating system uh, in 1972, and sine nomine associates uh, by IBM's kind permission, we are actually now the official repository for that bit of computing history. You can go out to our website, and these are posted on our website if you want to actually review the presentation. So, the, 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 the big point changes a little bit in terms of people start to think about a lot of organizations having the same sort of problems. And so, several organizations started to work together this is one of the first instances of collaborative conferencing in the outside world. Uh, talking about networking and some of the development there, the main function of these, these tools was to allow people to share code and share ideas. And so the discussions that were done on VMshare, the ability to share your code with somebody else without having to go down, get a $12 tape, write it on a tape, and then mail it to somebody. I didn't even just send it to them at a fairly nominal cost. Started to build this idea of if nobody has to solve the same problem twice. And if you, if you see my code and you see something that you think I did stupidly, then fix it and send it back. And then things get better for everybody. So the split development continues to be interesting. And there starts to be lots and lots of modifications floating around. User groups were critical to coordinating that software distribution. Uh, the very first computer user group, uh, environment uh, conference called Share, actually is still in business. It's been in business since 1958. Yes, thank you. They're still the very first user group. They coordinated the distribution of what was called the Waterloo Mods. <coughs> so they collected this stuff. Gee, sounds like a, a download center. That part of it was important to getting this process. Now, IBM is still fighting this hand tooth and nail at this point in the early 1980s. The second boneheaded stunt IBM did, you know, we've talked about the hardware design. Um, and by the way, I, I, for the record, I have a great affection for IBM as a company, but like any other big company, sometimes they soar like eagles, and sometimes, sometimes they flop like turkeys. Um, the other one that they did that most of the community pretty much agrees was a flop like turkey moment was they went to a policy called OCO, um, object code only. Uh, that means exactly what you think it means. They said, we're not giving away the source code, that's the keys to the kingdom. What if one of our competitors uses our source code to compete against us and they win? Um, and what that ended up doing was effectively that now said, we are going to do all the VM development in-house. If you're our customer, if you find a problem, tell us about it, and someday when we have time, we'll think about fixing it if we feel that meets our long-term business objectives. The community lost control of the direction of the product. Uh, the community reacted with the expected um, flaming <coughs> anger that you would think. Um, there are posters around. I think David actually may have one at our booth. There, there were posters that, that, that the slogan became, OCO is LOCO. Um, in the community, and there, I, I know a VM administrator at a large company in Ohio who still has one of those Loco is Oco posters hanging in his office. So this, this made a big impact on the community. As we can see from the teddy bear in the corner, uh, the, Loco cuts the heart out of VM. The, uh, by the way, for those who don't know, the teddy bear for, is the VM as Tux the Penguin is the Linux. He's their mascot. The uh, other thing that happened about the same time is uh, you guys probably all remember the Unix Wars when it was, you know, everybody was afraid Sun was going to take over and AT&T was going to take over and everybody was afraid everybody else was going to take over and it all pretty much fragmented and uh, that's the nice thing about the Unix standard of the day. The great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. So when we're still seeing a few of those, those sorts of 
that was going on today. So that all happened about the same time that, that IBM uh, was seeing the community part, part company with them from the mainframe. So again, just looking at the timeline, uh, these are all some of how some of the resolutions of those problems came out, and certainly this being a Linux-based conference. A lot, Linux played a big role in this, uh, in terms of bringing people together with a de facto solution that looked a lot like the idea, and one of the ideas that were shared in the VM community of make it better by commonly developing the, the problem. And so there's a lot of things we can do. And about this same point in time, uh, IBM realized that, there, that Unix was a force to be reckoned with out there in the world, and the mainframe couldn't really play in that environment. Um, among other things, the mainframe networking in the early, you know, in, in the time before this, mainframe networking was on a network uh, called SNA, not Senior Domain Associates. It was synchronous network architecture, or eventually I think it became systems network architecture. Um, if you remember the old, clunky, but durable, uh, a very clunky 3270, the green screen terminals, and the coax cable that those connected with. Very complex, very proprietary protocol. If any of you have ever on Ethernet implemented any of the OSI uh, full seven layer protocols, something that's things like MAP and MMS and those kinds of things, SNA makes that stuff look like baby steps. Um, it is an enormous complex protocol, very reliable, very robust, extremely scalable, but unfortunately nobody but IBM really ever implemented it uh, on a large scale. And IBM kind of thought that they were just going to rule the world and their networks were going to, and it was about the 1990s that the world pretty much whacked IBM upside the head with a giant clue by four and said, no, what we want is TCP IP because we want intranets now. We want to take all the internet technology that's out there in the public world. We think that's a really great enterprise network inside our company and we want the mainframe to play nice in that world. So one of the things IBM was doing about that time was they were trying to build Unix compatibility layers into their mainframe so that their mainframe could speak TCP IP so that it could interact well with a, with a distributed or semi-distributed world like Unix. So they did dip their toe in the water a little bit. They came out with a thing called Unix System Services or USS. Um, I played with that for a while in the, in the 90s. Um, it was kind of one of those things that say, well, nice try, guys, but uh, sorry, you just didn't get it. So just as passing there, uh, since Rick here is here in the room, he's got his hand up here. He's one of the developer, original developers of Bigfoot. And so a lot of the interesting, fun stuff that's, that was involved in that project had a lot to do with pushing that in that direction. That, Question, that, Rick. That, that USS thing, the guys at the other end of the hall from me depend on it. It's so, still there. So it is still being used. So you've got people who aren't familiar with Unix and, and don't know much about Linux that actually have to use that occasionally, whether they like it or not. That's cool to know. I, I didn't realize you were one of the co-authors of Bigfoot, otherwise I would have credited you. Sorry about that, right? I, you know, if he wants to credit me with more, then I'm, I'm not going to stop him. I, <laughs> somebody else actually did that. Rick and I shared an office. For I, I did find it ironic that the, the main author of the Bigfoot port, was, the Bigfoot was the first port that put Linux on an IBM System 390 mainframe. The author of that, we have Linus Torvalds, they had Linus Vepsis. So, we learned some things out of this process, and these are these are kind of strange things to say at a Linux conference. But in a lot of ways, the idea of Unix was not the beginning of open source. You're looking at an entire community of, main, of mainframe users that where this was an inherited exercise. It was something we did naturally because it's the way things were done. So the idea of writing things, I mean, again, using Rick here as an example, he's the first author of the first mainframe web server. And why, did we, why was it written? It was a beer bet, okay? The our Unix group sent us a case of beer that we couldn't write in a week. I will point out we won the beer. But the idea there is that, you know, that we turned around and gave it to everybody we knew. And people ran it. And people thought it was cool. There's some commonality here. There's a lot of ideas that have appeared in various forms where the direct origin is things that were shipped to the mainframe world. And that is starting to become a natural part of both Unix and specifically Linux development. And now with the work that's going on with Open Solaris in the mainframe, you're starting to see things come out of that environment. But the fundamental reason for that is that there are people involved. And there are people that believe that 
the idea of sharing what you've done and trying to make the community a better place by solving this problem and then sharing your solution with somebody else is what makes these operating systems viable and useful. So we think that there's a learning curve here. And, and by the way, that last point about community, um, IBM, if you've ever worked with IBM's engineering folks, they have some enormously talented, brilliant people. Um, I thought I was a pretty decent computer engineer until I met some of these, these uber geeks at IBM. And honestly, I think some of these guys and gals can actually control your mind telepathically if they will it so. Um, there's some pretty impressive people there. But even IBM, even for all their skill and all their talent in engineering, they really need a community of users because there's going to be people out there. The, the best thing for those of us who do open source, one of the things we all know if you've ever contributed to an open source project, or better yet, led one, the coolest thing in open source for me is when one of my users writes to me and says, hey, thanks for a pretty great program. By the way, you probably never envisioned this, but I'm doing this with it. Could, and I got the patch here for you that adds this new feature that makes this other thing I'm doing with it work a lot better. And the problem is if you bring everything inside and you don't have that community, you lose that. You get the ideas, maybe if you're lucky, but you don't get the actual contributions. And so over the years, all the times that the VM has not been a centerpiece of IBM's marketing, it's been the community that's held it together. All the times over the years that the Unix and Linux communities have struggled against entrenched management speak that says these are the fringe operating systems. You guys with the peeny caps on, you like that stuff, but for real business, we need this one over here, this other operating system. It's been the community in the, in the Unix and Linux world that has held those together and continues to make very much, very much in common in terms of the attitude of the community. Okay. Um, we, there's, so there's a lot of commonality here. Both of these were experimental systems created by and for developers. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of skunk work seen going on in both, both uh, areas. Both were held back by hidebound commercial interests. Uh, and, and by the way, VM was only released to IBM's customers after they saw it running at universities and labs and said, we need that, and IBM's like, no, 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 we don't really sell it. Listen, IBM, we want that, we're willing to pay for it, and by the way, you know, we're your nth biggest customer, and we want it. Do you hear me? And IBM's like, okay. And, you know, so th there's that kind of an attitude uh, going on in both, both areas. Uh, Unix was held back and was released only reluctantly. Both of these products included source code in the early days, uh, which at the time was fairly innovative. Uh, for a commercially produced operating system. Uh, and both of them have the, the history of community, and of course both have cute animal, animal mascots, which is essential to a thriving software community. <laughs> okay, Melinda Varian. How many have heard of Melinda Varian? All right, you should hear of Melinda Varian. You're gonna hear about Melinda Varian today. Melinda Varian is the goddess of the history of VM. She wrote a <coughs> very long essay tracing back most of the stuff we've talked about in detail that I, I, the only word that comes to mind is excruciating detail, but quite honestly, it's far from that. This paper is a fascinating read. It's out there. She has released it out on the internet for anybody to download. Um, we've, I've got the link at the end of the slides here. Um, but Melinda is pretty much the historian for this side of computing history. And she came up after looking for many years at how software gets written in many different platforms, she came up with a set of rules of where really good software comes from. These things are an absolute gem. Great, great philosophy of programming. Good software only comes from small groups of very skilled programmers. Now this does not fly in the face of the open source theory that says, you know, we can have the, the, the Unix community and the Linux community are very large communities with hundreds of thousands or even millions of contributors. <coughs> that's not what she's saying. She's not saying that's a bad idea. What she's saying is individual pieces. You can't develop pieces of code by committee. So you have to kind of uh, have, uh, have small groups of really good people collaborating on it. It's got to be a labor of love. It's got to be born of the author's desire to scratch their own itch. You have to have the passion there, not just this is my job and my boss told me to do it. It's got to be never finished. It's got to continue to grow. It's got to be hacked at by the community. So it needs to be something 
that, that people will play with and use in ways that you don't necessarily think of. It needs an intelligent, adventurous, passionate universe user community, that's a direct quote, with enough influence to guide the development of the product. Notice any parallels here with open source? There's a lot in the VM family values, these are people who are accustomed to working in teams and sharing code. <coughs> they're used to having to fix their own problems, and they're used to tossing out ideas and expecting that a lot of them will fail, but some of them will become really big, good ideas, and they're used to dreaming big. That's something that commercial big companies are averse to doing because it's too risky. The open source community and the user communities can dream big because they have no financial stake in not dreaming big. And this is what has empowered a lot of this. The, the, the idea of bringing it to the mainframe was uh, was born out of this kind of thing. IBM fought it tooth and nail until it actually happened. Next slide. So what went wrong with VM? Well, they closed the source, they closed the tool set, and they put it in a proprietary language. The users lost control of the product and didn't guide its evolution anymore. Risk averse goals, we talked about that already from the corporate backing. Uh, and the vendor just plain lack of long-term commitment. And she specifically says, closing the source stifled innovation. Stifled innovation, her words, applied to VM, applies to open source community as we know it as well. Next. And this would be really the concern also that we see with a lot of the current Linux distributions is we're starting to see some of these issues. And so we want to raise this as a, in some part, as a cautionary tale in that we've seen what happens seen, for example, VM move from the position in educational institutions from once every educational institution that had this move in at pretty much everywhere. OSUs have a very large VM uh, system. It's pumped. They went from 50, 60,000 installations down to about 10 because they started down this path. And we're starting to see the Linux So, um, steel with style. Um, David, I'm going to let you talk about Mother's Rules of Basic Dialogue here. Sure. Mother, by the way, being, uh, again, Melinda Varian. And I'm serious, if you haven't read her paper, please do. It's really, really interesting. Part of what came out of that paper was some essentially basic rules of how we engage each other in terms of trying to fight things on the last slide. How do we go about keeping the Linux distributors from doing this to us? And in a lot of ways, there are some basic dialogue rules. How many people here read the Linux kernel mailing list? Okay, a few of you. How many of you are upset by the fact that it's so possible to read it? You know, there's a lot of people here, and I see that. There are some basic rules for that. This is an area where I think there's a lot of cross pollinization between the mainframe community and the Linux community, and part of that basic responsibility is how we address each other. Um, the things here are, are seem obvious. So those of you, you know, your mother's told you to play nice with others. Well, occasionally there's some folks out there that can use a few clue bats. The idea of using things that already exist, open source theory, you know, it's very straightforward stuff. But the points that she's making at the bottom here is that we're all the community is only as good as we ask ourselves to be. And without those kinds of basic dialogue rules, we really are going to start to fragment. And again, we're already starting to see that in the Linux community. Uh, there's a lot of difficulty to getting new things accepted, and getting new things accepted in a way that can be uh, widely implemented. But without those basic rules of discussion, I think we're going we're to run into that problem. Basic civility, and if we need volunteers, um, that whole thing about flies, honey, and vinegar, you know, we sometimes forget that in the open source community. So, I think to wrap up, you know, that's a big concept. It sounds like uh, mom and apple pie, but one of the things that we noticed when we were thinking about this presentation was really that there are still a lot of commonalities. There's a lot of interlock between the two communities. And there's a lot of ideas going back and forth. I mean, the idea. And, so and putting we, Linux actually on the mainframe has taken where there were already a lot of commonalities. The fact that Linux actually now physically runs on the mainframe has made that an even tighter bond. And we're fools if we ignore that capability. So, you know, the cautionary tale that we've told to some extent is the, the issues that Linux and the Linux community are going to face probably within the next year. 
we want to raise this as a, somebody's been here before, and we think that there are things that can be learned from that process. Uh, yeah, I'll second Scott's recommendation for reading the Lynn's paper, because in a lot of cases, the last section of that paper details how we explained this case to IBM. And this went well up into the IBM board. And by the way, if you are a, a, a deep hardware geek, um, my degree is in computer engineering with an emphasis on hardware design. There is a technical appendix at the end of Melinda's paper. If you really want to geek out, I have to go back and read it again because it was deeply technical enough. I didn't understand it the first time through. This is not all about politics and management and history. There's some, some serious technical content there as well. But I want to emphasize that what we've talked about here is what you are going to have to deal with in the next two years. And please, you know, you, we don't have to make these mistakes again. We can take a learning curve from this. I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up here by, you know, in a lot of ways, that cross-pollinization is really, really handy. So if you get a chance, you know, those, those guys over in the mainframe group really are, might have some useful things to know. So, you know, give your teddy bear a head. It tends to save the butt very often. Uh, the web biography, uh, Melinda Varian is that wonderful lady on the lower right hand corner of your slide. Uh, thanks also to Larry Ewing, as you may have noticed, I blatantly grabbed all his tux clip art for the slides. And uh, I think that, that the tux is a brilliant piece of uh, artwork and I've always loved it. And that's our contact information. We also have a booth outside. We're kind of down at that end. You're welcome to stop by and talk with us in detail. I know we've cut into our Q&A time a little bit here, but we like to talk about this stuff. We have fun doing what we do, and we'd love to chat with you later if you feel inclined to stop by. It doesn't, doesn't have to be business. It can be just, be, just be for fun and work a little thing. Yeah, we brought some really fun goodness here. Okay, so back to that, uh, any questions? <coughs> We're right on the We've got about 10 minutes for Q&A, so anybody? Yes, sir. I, you kind of lost me at the very end, uh, and I may have misunderstood your point. Thank you, that is easier. Uh, and when you said that uh, the Linux community is going to face what the VM community went through. And I'm thinking there is no company that owns Linux that can say we don't want any creative destruction going on. Uh, by analogy, when uh, Oracle bought Sun, a number of people said that they can't kill my SQL, it's already forked. Uh, so when you say there's a danger, what specifically are you thinking of? Me specifically is that looking at specifically a lot of the enterprise markets, uh, the distributors pay, play a similar role in terms of they actually, in an enterprise environment, they arbitrator of what goes into production in an environment is determined of by what does the distributor support agreement support. So to some extent it's a it's a niche view of the enterprise specific. But as the Linux becomes more and more important in different communities, I think you're going to see that mentality start to push down in terms of it was, since we're seeing Linux in distributed devices, since we're seeing Linux in, in smartphones, many of those are highly uh, configuration controlled environments, smartphones especially. When you think about uh, you know, an Android phone or something like that, uh, there is still a gateway there where the vendor vets what is able to be delivered to your device. And that is a very, very slippery slope. The other, the other piece I would add to this, um, I agree with everything David said, but I would also add, look at the large distributions that get certified by some of the application vendors. You, know, you have IBM certifying WebSphere on certain distributions of Linux, but you know, go find Go, go look up whether or not Oracle will certify Oracle database server on Gen2. Um, I don't know offhand, but I'm betting that's probably not the case. 
So there is, as, as more and more applications, as more and more of these corporate platforms move to Linux in, in the generic sense as a supported platform, they're not moving to Linux, they're moving to Red Hat Linux, or they're moving to SUSE Enterprise, Linux Enterprise Server, SLES, uh, or, you know, but how many of them support Debian? Ubuntu is starting to get a little support, but not very many of these big commercial players support the small distributions. That has the effect. Maybe it doesn't force, in a literal sense, the Linux community to consolidate, but it does put a pressure on that because now if there's less of an incentive to want to go create your own distro if you know that your distro may not ever have any significant market share, even in the open source community among progressive thinking companies, because management, once again, is risk averse, even though they, their techies might say, hey, look, we know Oracle isn't certified on Gen 2, but I'm confident I can make it run. They want, as, as one of my ex-bosses used to put it, they want a neck to ring when something breaks, so they want to run it on SLES or Red Hat because they want to be able to say it broke this is on your supported distro of Linux, therefore, dear Oracle, you have to fix it. And I don't mean to pick on Oracle, they're just the big giant company that comes to mind. Did that answer your question? This is Doug McElroy. I'm really glad I, we said we weren't going to do a lot of detail. <laughs> uh, a very nice presentation. It, it's, I, I'd like to add a couple of more things about pushing things back in time. It's, I was the guy who brought PL1 to Multics. It was not the first operating system written in a high level language. At the time, Multics was just a gleam in the eye of MIT. Burroughs was selling the B5000 on the, in the commercial market, and it was proven. Its operating system was written in Alcohol 65. Uh, also, it is not a very new thing for Unix to make it to a mainframe. The Cray 1 ran Unix. There was also UTS for earlier systems as well. Actually, is still widely deployed in the uh, in the phone company. Uh, many of the switch uh, accounting pieces are are still running on UTS, which was in the late '65 port. Uh, I'm Peter Salas, and since Doug started uh, pushing things back, I thought I there were two there were a couple of historical niggles that I uh, was irked by. The number one, the Multix machine was a GE machine. And uh, it, not a Bell or an IBM. Second, um, Brian Kernahan personally disowns having invented Unix, that is to say the word. And uh, I have been trying to convince people of that, that rumor that he did so is false for about 15 years now. I, I clearly have not gotten anywhere. I, I apologize for that. that. The fault of that is mine. My source was the Bell Labs official website. <laughs> All I can say is, at least you blame my Bell Labs. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. I blame Bell Labs because Doug's sitting right next to me. But the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the third and, and perhaps least important thing is that IBM encouraged the formation of user groups originally. It subsidized share in the 50s originally oh, because originally. The, Pardon me, the operators, uh, as they were then called, we would call them sysads probably, of the 701, when they had to move to the 704, were totally bewildered by what they had to do, and they were encouraged to, now I pardon me, to share their information and experience, and IBM subsidized that. And no argument that IBM is in favor of the existence of user groups. The issue became when the user groups wanted the open source and IBM saw commercial reasons why they didn't want that to happen. Um, IBM still actively supports and sponsors user groups, including this conference. So I'm not trying to portray IBM as a, as a big evil company, just to say that there was a disagreement about how user groups, what role user groups should play, not whether they existed or not. So we do stand corrected on the, on the uh, issue of Kernaghan. Uh, again, the source for that was the was the Lab website, so I guess I should have, to double check. I thought they'd be pretty authoritative. Any other questions? All right, thanks.
Thanks for coming. Uh, we have an extra five minutes.